First off, I want to thank the uh, brave men and women who work behind the wall. I want to thank them on a national level because their job goes on How recognized. How do they try to turn a guard? Well, President, uh, correction officer. Sorry, I apologize. Uh, but correction officer. Uh... How you guys doing today? It's Anthony Ganji. Welcome to another episode of Tear Talk. Russ Hamilton sent us a great video just now. It's for our rookies, our new boots, people that are new to the job, or maybe even people entering. But the cool thing is about this video, because guys, there's a lot of tips being provided here, is that we could also have our senior officers check out this video, because this video provides a lot of guidance that with experience, it could easily be complimented. So like, if you're able to watch this video and you see a new boot coming in, maybe you can guide them. Maybe you can add that extra oomph that's needed, because this is us just giving tips. We need people with experience that are next to them just to help them apply the tips that are provided. And I think that's kind of what makes this channel great because we have a mixture of both senior officers and rookies. So it's great to see the, the dance. And when Russ does a video like this, you know, it doesn't just end here. It's how we could take this video into the real world. And it's great because videos like this are giving us better new people. It's helping us. You know, so it's great for us to reinforce what's in these videos, but the best way to do it again is to have that experienced person next to that rookie to guide them. Like, okay, this is the advice you were given by Russ. Let me tell you how this advice fits into what we do. I also want to give one more tip. And this is something that I think is the foundation of what Russ is going to tell you in the video after the sponsors is know yourself. That's the key. Know if you can do this job, listen to your gut. Because the last thing you want is to find out when shit hits the fan that this job isn't for you. That puts everybody at risk. So know the incentive, know the motivation of why you're doing this job. And when you go in, listen to your gut, listen to what your gut is telling you. Is this for you? Is this not for you? Don't wait. Because in the end, I'll have more respect for you admitting that, hey, I just couldn't do this job. Because that means you're not going to get us hurt. The last thing I want is someone that's just going to doubt that, thinking they can, even though their body's telling them they can't. And all of a sudden, when shit hits the fan, I'm looking to depend on you, and you're gone. Or you freeze. All right, guys. Now, if you haven't, the show Tear Talks for you, brave men and women that work in corrections. So please, subscribe, interact, engage, comment, hit that bell. That bell's going to notify you every time I post up a video. We're going to go to Russ, who's got some spot-on advice for our rookie CEOs. Again, looking to complement that advice with some experience from people that work behind that wall that can be partnered with these rookie CEOs. So when we come back, that's what our video is about. And uh, as always, guys, just uh, I appreciate you. I really do. And Russ, really spot on today. It's a really great video. I can't wait to get the comments and can't just wait to just have this engagement. I stand by for our sponsors when we come back. Show goes to Russ. I wanted to attend a university that had an intelligence program. I wanted to look at problems different. I wanted to increase my critical thinking abilities. AMU offered those avenues to expand. Obtaining your degree as an adult, you're actually paying yourself and investing in yourself. You can't put a dollar on it, it's priceless. It's something that can never be taken away from you. American Military University. Learn from the leader. Guys, inmate manipulation is a course that is highly needed. It's the process that's so slow moving and subtle that you don't realize it's happening. When inmates choose to manipulate, they manipulate our need to react. Situational awareness and insight is going to save your career. It's going to save you from doing foolish things. Listen to your gut. So the more insight we have, the more we can recognize what isn't so overt, and we can correct our behavior before we fall into a trap that we can't get out of. If you allow an inmate to pull you out of your prescribed role, you are opening up a door for a host of problems. Inmate manipulation, the psychology behind inmate manipulation. Available now. Link in description. Hey there, Teartop fans. Russ Hamilton here from Keepers of Chaos. So, I just had a burning desire to do a video today, and I was trying to think up a good topic, and so I decided that I was going to yeah, devote and uh, dedicate this particular video to you guys that are new in the business out there. That's right. Um, I just wanted to touch on some topics that I think will really help you guys and hopefully um, 
give you guys something to be able to look at down the line to try and better yourselves and to try and just get on top of the game. All right. So a lot of different uh, terms for the new people out there, you know, new boots, fish, newbies, new jacks. Anyway, uh, down in the comment section, if you guys got some something that maybe most of us haven't heard yet, be sure and include those because I'd like to, you know, be up on all the latest terminology myself. Uh, but the reason that I kind of had this topic kind of pop into my brain was this tends to be one of the number one things that I get asked or that I see being asked in other forums is uh, someone comes out and they say, they say, hey, I'm starting on Monday. Uh, what are some good tips? Uh, you know, I'm finishing the academy and uh, I want to know what I should do when I get there on the line. And so, you know, there's a lot of interest in, you know, having some tips, uh, kind of knowing what to expect and some of those things. So I thought I would, you know, just get right into all of those. All right. So anyway, with regards to the tips that I see out there, there's some pretty good tips. There's some really marginal tips. There's some bad, bad tips. And there's also some downright dangerous ones. And so I'm going to take you through just a few of those real quick before I get into the next section of this. Um, whenever I see that, you know, the number one thing that someone always says, and it drives me nuts, is this, firm, fair, and consistent. All right? And the problem with that and the reason that it drives me nuts is because so much of the time, it's just left without any framework on it. And you're just kind of left, especially if you're a new person, you know, what am I supposed to do with that firm, fair and consistent? What is that about? You know, or even worse, sometimes these people that you're talking about firm, fair and consistent, they don't even understand the principle themselves and they go out to flush it out in the wrong way. Not a good thing. I'm going to run it down to you really quick, really succinctly. All right. Firm, fair, and consistent. I'll let you figure out what those adjectives mean as far as, you know, just in the English language. But the purpose of firm, fair, and consistent is one thing. It gives us guideposts to be able to stay on the path, the path of our professionalism. Firm, fair, and consistent, consistent is for us, not the inmates. That is not how we deal with inmates. That is not what we're doing. We're doing that to be able to stick to our professionalism. The, the inmates are, are just kind of, you know, a side thing that happens within the body of that firm, fair, and consistent. We do that so we don't lose our jobs, so that we don't end up becoming a criminal ourselves, and so that we don't end up having to pay a price by not adhering to our standards of professionalism. Adhere to your standards of professionalism. Firm, fair, and consistent will happen all by itself. That's all you need to know. Um, I've seen time and time again where I hear, well, you know what, if you treat these guys with respect, they'll respect you and you'll never, ever get assaulted. I'm here to tell you that's a lie. All right. In corrections, there is going to be conflict. All right. There is going to be conflict because the people that you're charged with overseeing, the inmates, right, they're criminals, right? That means they have an antisocial personality disorder. No two ways about it. That means that they're not going to adhere to the same morals and values that you have. So no matter how much respect that you give them, all right, that's only coming back at you as long as you're not doing your job. So I just want to be clear on that. You know, you guys got, you guys got to understand that corrections is conflict. Now your academy and people like me and Anthony Ganji, um, and others are going to help you along the way, give you tools to deal with that conflict. Understand, though, that ultimately um, every bit of conflict is backed up by what? You guys should know this. It's backed up by use of force. Those guys aren't staying in their cells all night, every night, because, yeah, they've just decided that they're going to get along with society. All right? Everything is back backstopped by the use of force or the threat of use of force. Now, hopefully, we don't ever have to go that far along the continuum, but sometimes we're going to have to. And the idea that somehow you're going to get out of conflict is, you know, it's, it's a fantasy. All right. So let's just let's get that straight. But you're going to have the tools or you're going to develop the tools that you're going to need to deal with that. And you're going to learn policy and procedure 
and you're going to have the backup that you need, hopefully, and all of that when it comes to that time. All right. So there's no shrugging it off. All right. So um, the next thing I really want to emphasize, and I'm getting back to that question to give the best bit of advice that can be given. All right. I'm going to tell it to you right now. All right. And um, that is when you get to your institution, when you get to your facility and stuff, there's going to be some guys and gals there that are going to be subject matter experts in particular fields, maybe even several fields. And, you know, it's going to be things like report writing, or contraband interdiction, searches, uh, use of force, uh, handcuffing techniques, gangs, you know, whole big cornucopia of different um, skills, skill sets, knowledge and training that you're going to need. All right. You're going to go out there and you are going to pick the brains of these people that know these different things that you need. And you know what? If, if you don't know who they are, ask around. Someone's going to tell you, you know, they're going to say, uh, hey, uh, you know, who's the best person to talk about gangs? You know, and they're going to give you a name and you're going to go off and find that person and talk to them. Or maybe if you've got an email at work or something, you can say, hey, you know, give me the quick lowdown. And hopefully that person, and oftentimes they will be, are going to, is going to be the kind of individual who's going to want to help and going to be wanting to put that type of information out there. And so that's always a good thing. And that is the number one piece of advice that I have to give, which, you know, quite simply, if I just distill it down, learn the profession. All right. Learn the profession. That is what is going to get you where you want to go. Now, that in and of itself is just a strategy. The tactics and stuff, well, I filled in on a couple of those about, you know, finding those people and picking the brains. Just do that along through your entire career, all right? You know, you've got to learn the um, profession, so figure out what the tactics are to make you be able to pull off that strategy that you're looking at. So the next thing that you really need to learn when you're new is communication, all right? And once again, this is one of those things where people are going to say all kinds of things about it. It's true. Communication is key. I'm going to give you just a couple of, you know, little tips, little tricks, little observations that I've learned over the years to just try and uh, make this, you know, pan out in a way that you can understand it and you can start applying it. Because it's not enough for me to just uh, tell you, hey, you know what? Communication is great. Communication is key. Be on your way. Okay. That's not going to cut it. So anyway, when I'm talking about communication, obviously, the first thing on that list is you have to learn to talk to inmates. All right. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. So how do you go about doing that? Well, hopefully, one of the things that helps is, is if you're a little bit of an extrovert. But it doesn't matter if you're an, you're an introvert or you don't have a way with words. This is something that you can de develop. With some of you, it's going to take more time than with certain other people. Now, that's nothing to worry about. You're gonna, you have a whole career ahead of you to learn all of this stuff. Communication is just one facet. So the first thing that you really want to start doing is, is you want to start putting yourself in a position where you have to talk to these guys, where you're finding out things about them, where you're interviewing them. Whether they realize it or not, be out there, be proactive and start asking them questions. Now, not personal questions, because I'm going to tell you, um, with communication and with, uh, learning to do some of these other things that are, that I'm going to talk about, there's risk because communication is a two way street, right? You're going to, you're going to, um, get something from them. They're going to want something in return. The deal is, is you got to be able to just really not give them anything that matters. Nothing about your personal life, nothing that puts you in a position where you're compromised, even to the smallest degree where you feel you have to have that quid pro quo, where you have to give something back to them. None of that. But by putting yourself in a position where you have to interface with these individuals, you know, um, that's, you know, getting them to their medical appointment, asking them about where they're needing to go. You know, asking them about, you know, why are you here in this area? You know, or having them come up, hey, let me see your ID. You know, just to learn what their name is. Oh, your name is such and such. 
you can use that as a basis to strike up a conversation. Now, like I said, this isn't going to be about anything personal. This is just for you to get information, however little, and to start accumulating a knowledge base of how to talk to these individuals. All right. So, you know, it's kind of hard to point out everything that you should be doing to develop that skill. But if you have a problem with it, and there's lots of people that do, you're not going to ever start developing those skills by hanging back and just thinking, man, I'll, I'll start tomorrow or the next day or next week. Force yourself. Corrections is about developing that discipline where if you have a weak spot, let's start working on it. All right. Let's put ourselves into a position where we have to start communicating. Put yourself in a position where, you know, maybe you've got a work crew and or maybe you can volunteer to run a work crew, even if it's just, you know, for a day or an hour or whatever, where you're starting to give these guys orders and, uh, you know, have them, you know, talk um, back to you. Or they say, oh, hey, you know what? We're going to go need to go get the brooms or some paper towels or whatever so that you can start feeling at home in this environment. Now, that's not to say that we want to desensitize ourselves because that's going to do nothing but build complacency. But at the same time, we want to develop that confidence so that we're able to just, you know, go out there and start spitting. Earth. Hey, you guys, go ahead, uh, turn all those chairs up and go ahead and mop the floors. Just leave the chairs up. We'll come back and get those later. Learn to start, you know, being an authority figure because that is exactly what you are. Okay. Um, the next thing I really want to talk about is, and I really, really want to caution you on this. Okay. Because I don't want my words to be misinterpreted, but you want to start building rapport with inmates. Okay. But this is a dangerous thing because what happens to a lot of people when they start this rapport building, that's all they ever end up doing. They build rapport, build rapport, build rapport, and they never get anything back from the inmates because that's the nature of the game, right? You're going to build rapport with inmates, build rapport, and then the instant you say no, all that rapport is gone. So then what do you feel like? Well, you feel all your hard work and rapport building just went out the window. Well, that's just the way it is because these are inmates, okay? Um, I used to have a supervisor who used to drive me nuts because he was always, you know, we'd take things and he'd give them back and, and he was, well, I'm, I'm building rapport. All right, that's no good, people. <clears throat> if you're building rapport, it's building rapport to be able to talk to them um, in situations where you need to get some type of information, um, you know, maybe some type of compliance, um, you know, maybe just to be able to put your expectations out there toward them. But it's never to the point where we're just going to keep giving and giving and giving and just, you know, let that string, that reel off your fishing line pff, go forever. You know, so you have to be careful. You have to not think of it as a as a quid pro quo where you are just going to, you know, never put your foot down. This is a way for you to start understanding inmates. But you know what? When it's time to cut it off, it's time to cut it off. And if all of that supposed hard work goes out the window, no big deal. You'll start again tomorrow. Yeah, rapport building, it can be important, but it's not an end to itself. Don't ever get caught up in that mentality. That's how inmates manipulate you. You know, um, I've got, if you look further on Tear Talk, you'll see that, oh, You'll see a whole video that I did on quid pro quo. So understand that if that's what you're doing at that moment in time, that's the only moment in time that you're doing it. All right. Don't get caught up into that thing where you're rapport building and it, it just never ends. All right. Because what did I say before? Corrections is conflict. All right. There are going to be conflicts and there's no sense in just trying to put them off because all that's going to do is, is put you in a position further and further behind where you're never going to be able to exert enough pressure until it comes to the point where something really bad happens. And then there's no choice. And then we're talking about a lot of other report writing skills that have to do with use of force or you getting hurt or something like that. So you have to look at rapport building in context. You're going to see it along the way. I guarantee you, probably in your first week, you're going to see someone that's a rapport builder out there. 
And that's all they do is build rapport, hoping it'll never end, hoping that they can stay on it through their whole career and never get hurt, never make a difference, never be an impact player, never stop something serious from happening. Just have the blinders on. Okay, so let me go on to the next part here, okay? Um, the last of these three things I'm talking about right in this section is observe interactions, all right? This is really important for you to be able to understand, and I'll get into a little uh, analogy, a little metaphor um, down the line a little bit from this. This observe, observe interactions, right? You want to watch inmates interacting with each other. You want to watch inmates interacting with staff. You want to watch yourself interacting with inmates to see how they respond to different things, to understand what their stressors are, to understand what their motivations are, to understand what their triggers are, right? Because what this is going to do is this is this going to put you in a better position to be able to understand the game. Because when it's all said and done, what is this? It's a great big game. And your choice is going to be whether or not you're going to be a pawn in the game or whether you're going to be a rook or a bishop, a queen, a king. Man, too many people too long in their careers for years and years. Sometimes they never get out of it. They stay down there in that pawn thing where they never see, they never understand that, you know what, they're just going through it. Blinders on, complacent, dumb. So anyway, let's move on to the next section. So this part that I'm going to talk to you about is going to be just a little bit about inmate discipline, right? Um, usually when you're in corrections and you start talking about inmate discipline, it's almost always about the riding or charging aspect. And so, yeah, that's definitely the biggest element of it. Um, there's another element of it um, that I want to go over with real quick that's really simple. I just want to talk about it, and that's compliance, right? Ultimately, the one thing that we want from inmates is compliance. It's pure. It's simple, okay? We want an inmate, um, if he's in the day room or his cell or whatever, to be keeping his little area clean, the cell, the day room, or whatever. We want him to go to his programs. We want him to not be um, doing a bunch of STG gang stuff and, you know, sharpening shanks or drinking liquor or any of those foul things, right? There's different ways to exert pressure on inmates. And the formal one, of course, is always the write-up or the charging document, depending on whether there's a chance it's going to it's going to go to court or to be um, screened or screened in or out by the DA, all right. But some of the other pressures that you can bring to bear is just being in their business, all right. Inmates don't want you around, so the more that you're around a particular individual, a group of individuals, because they're calling out their own attention to you, the more pressure just by your presence alone that you can put on those individuals. Because when you're in their areas and doing things like, oh, a little search here and there, checking out, oh, some people left a bunch of, oh, contraband on top of this. Who does this belong to, guys? No one's going to claim it, right? Um, you're going to learn a lot of different little tricks like that that you can pull off to make things uncomfortable for them so that you do get compliance. I tend to like for um, write-ups to be, you know, either a last resort, if it's something, especially if it's something, you know, simple, you know, if it's a, some kind of low-level uh, disciplinary infraction. Um, some of the higher-up things, some of the things that are, you know, more serious that maybe constitute, uh, you know, misdemeanors or felonies of some sort, you're going to have no choice but to write them. But these other things, if you're always writing paperwork, all you're generally doing is, is passing the buck onto the next shift, all right? And they're having to deal with it because that paperwork means nothing sometimes to some of these fellows. Or you're creating a bunch of work for the people that have to hear it and find those individuals guilty. So we try and find ways to put pressure on inmates that doesn't rely on a write-up, if we can. Now, there, there's some circumstances, especially when you're new, where you might have to write them at the very beginning on stupid stuff just to get their attention. 
But don't let that become such a habit that that's the only tool that you have in your bag. And that's part of what talking to these guys and learning about them entails because it allows you to find those little chinks in their armor that you can use to bring them back into line without it being a write-up or ending up in a use of force or something like that. Okay, so I just want you to keep that in mind. So um, with respect to, okay, once you're to that point where you have to write these guys, i got just a couple little things to, you know, tell you that are really going to help because we always want that right up to stick, right? So what do you do? Provide all the elements of the crime, all right? Everything, um, you know, whether it's trespassing, which in corrections often we have what? Out of bounds, right? All right? There's elements to that. Those elements are the things that we have to take and that we have to show in our report. So you put all of them in, every element that proves that's a crime. All right. It's the same thing about theft. How do you prove that it was theft? Well, he wasn't supposed to have that on him. Well, do we know that he stole it then? Do we not? Do we know for certain that someone didn't give it to him? We have to be able to prove those elements. So we have to be able to put those things in there. So this is part of critical thinking that I alluded to earlier. And we're going to touch on some more here in just a, in just a little bit in the, in the very next segment, right? But you want to be able to take all of those elements and put them into that report. Everything. Okay. Um, you also want to be able to write out loopholes. All right. By write out loopholes, these guys, all right, you give a guy an order to do something and he just doesn't do it. Whatever else happens. So you write him up over it. Okay. And so you're not, and so you're telling exactly what happened, but you don't write out the loopholes. All right. What do I mean by loopholes? Well, maybe this guy, he's been given an order. He says, you know, I just do not speak English very well. All right. Maybe he just says he didn't understand or he thought you meant something else. Be clear, concise, explicit. Make sure that you're able to put that. You know, three times I asked him if he understood. He repeated the orders back to me so that I knew that he, so that I knew that he knew what I was talking about. So, you have to write around those loopholes, whether you like it or not. Does it impact your report? Yeah, it makes it longer. But sometimes that's what we have to do to be able to, you know, hook these guys in, be able to, you know, actually make that write up, have a feel for them so that they, so that it hurts them a little bit. All right. So the last thing I want to talk to you is, is about a word. Um, and it's a really simple word, but I just want you to know what it means. And it might actually help you a little bit with this. And that's probative or more specifically probative value. So probative value, when you use that in a sentence, it just means that it tends to support the charge against the inmate. It just helps in some way. And that can be anyway. It can be everything from some smoke and gun that phew, that guy's as guilty as hell to just some little other thing. For instance, all right, if you catch the guy lying, and you make that clear in your report between whatever the different elements of the crime, of the charge are, all right? The fact that he lied goes a long ways toward proving what? And he's probably guilty. Also, if he changes his story, does the fact that he changed his story the first time he told you X, the next time he told you Y, and the time after that he told you Z, what does that do? It bolsters the evidence against him. It has probative value. It tends to support the fact that he's not in the right. Something else is going on there. He's lying. He's changing his story. Um, the other thing that things that have probative value are eyewitnesses. If you have three or four eyewitnesses against this guy, other staff, and you put them in there, don't leave them out. All right. All that does what? It's probative value. It bolsters your case. Um, don't forget too about uh, any physical evidence, you know, whether it's a shank, whether it's a, a phone you found and it had his home phone number on it, um, that tends to bolster the fact that, hey, that phone is probably his, right? Because it has what? It has probative value. That piece of information has probative value. So these are all the things you want to put in there. Um, videos too, you know, if, if uh, your unit has, you know, good video and it's something that you, that you can use and it shows, you know, that inmate run across the court and punch, you know, inmate B in the face. And 
you know, he would say, well, I, it was self-defense. All right. Does that video have probative value? Yes, yes, it does. So these are all things I just want you to think about. It's not an exhaustive writing course that I'm trying to take you through here. It's the things that I'm trying to tell you that you need to know when you're new to think about. All right. Okay. So we're almost done. So I just wanted to take you through one little metaphor that I sometimes use and then a few other little points here just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about between things like when I talk about the game of corrections and such. But one thing that I always compare corrections to is an onion. And if you imagine that you're a tiny little ant and you're on the outside of that onion, you're the new guy, right? And you know what? Every direction you go, all you see is that horizon, that skin of that onion, no matter what you do, all right? Because your perspective is limited because you haven't gained enough knowledge yet to be able to understand the depth of the layers that you're standing directly over, all right? So one thing that a guy taught me this a long time ago about my particular job was, um, you know, he looked it up early on in his career in the penal code to see just what our powers were. You know, you have probably some phenomenal powers if you're sworn. Even if you're not sworn, you probably have some pretty good statutory authority to do a lot of different things that are defined as your duties. So you can carry them out. I find all the time supervisors and managers, they're always afraid for us to flex and use those powers. Use them to the best of your ability, all right? Figure it out. Figure out what your powers are. Flex them out. Be able to go in there and be that impact player, not just sitting back, you know, kind of, you know, waiting for stuff to happen, not being proactive, just, you know, observe and then respond instead of, you know, preventing and preempting, and being on top of things and, you know, interrupting a critical incident, be that individual, you know, no matter how much extra responsibility you have to take on in the end, it will make your career much more interesting. Um, you'll be able to take a lot more pride in yourself. All right. So keep those things in mind. Um, no policy and procedure, right? The reason that you need to know policy and procedure is number one, to keep yourself safe. Number two, to be able to write these guys up on the uh, disciplinary infractions and so forth that you're catching them in, uh, but also to be able to use for yourself if someone ever tries to tell you that you've done something wrong. No, I know policy and procedure. More than policy and procedure, I know the law. More than the law, I know case law. Do you know case law? Here's two for you to look up. Graham v. Connor and um, Tennessee versus Garner. Look those up, all right? I'm not going to do them here, but just start knowing that there's a lot of case law out there that impacts us and gives us a lot of broad discretion. Most of it's pretty good on our side of it. So just start thinking of those things. Start learning about it so that if something, you know, questionable happens, you can fight your way out of it or write your way out of it. All right. Now I'm going to come last to what I think is one of the most important aspects of the job that new guys especially need to learn because so often this is missing from a lot of what we do. We get so caught up in just having an, okay, I have my post orders and um, I have my desk area and I have a phone to call my sergeant and that tends to be your little world, right? Well, if that's all your world is and you're not thinking critically, you can miss some big factors, all right? And this example that I'm going to give, I don't want you to focus on what the bad thing that the officer did in this situation is. I want you to vo focus on the critical thinking aspects. Anthony and I um, did this video on this just, I don't know, probably about a month ago or so. And it was just such a great example for being able to use critical thinking skills so that we're able to stop, you know, prevent and preempt critical incidents. Um, this particular scenario was just about an officer who misplaced his keys. Now that should never happen. 
But if it did, all right, and uh, inmate goes, well, hey, I found him over here. All right. So the next part of the scenario that we were talking about is should this officer tell on himself? Oh, yeah. And then what do we do? Do we give the inmate a big pat on the back? Are we using our critical thinking skills if that's what we're doing? What do our critical thinking skills tell us? First, they tell us that this inmate could be involved in doing something nefarious with those keys. What could he be doing? Could he be making, you know, wax mold of them? Yeah. Is that a concern? Is that something we have to address? Damn right it is. All right. What else do we have to address? Could these keys have got him or someone else into an area they weren't supposed to be in? Yeah. What could that lead to? Could lead to an escape. Is that something that we should have to take into account? Right, it is. So now you're starting to see where critical thinking goes. All right. Does it also lead to what? Areas where there might be staff who have been what? Taken hostage? Beaten? Killed? Is that a concern for us? Right, it is. So what do we start doing? The first thing that we're doing is, is we're recalling everyone in the yard. All right. We're cuffing this guy up. He's going to SEG until the investigation is done. Right. Are we worried about that? No, we have to get this thing lined out. We're going to have to count everyone, make sure that every inmate's accounted for because an escape didn't happen. We're also going to have to do what? We're going to have to account for every staff member on duty. All right. We're going to have to make sure that there were no breaches in the security. And then we're going to have to worry about whether he made any molds of those keys. All right. There are also a lot of other things that I'm not going to just deal with in that, but I'm just trying to show you how critical thinking works. It's not taking things at what? At face value. At face value? At surface value. At the surface value of the onion. Right? Because that's what most new people are used to. They're used to accepting and seeing things at face value because they're on the surface of that. They don't see the layers underneath. And this is what I'm trying to bring to you. I'm trying to bring to you critical thinking skills. All right. Critical thinking is being able to see likely bad possibilities. All right. Likely bad possibilities. If you're able to do that, you'll be able to put yourself in positions to stop people from getting hurt and killed or from escapes happening. All right. So that's what I'm uh, hoping you're going to focus on. I hope that all you new guys will look at this and go, yeah, I've got to step up my game. If you're not quite into it yet, if you're just in the process, man, make sure that you're subscribed to, to Tear Talk. Make sure that your buddies are. When you go to your academy or whatever, tip them up to us. We'll appreciate it. We're here to help. Anyway, this is Russ Hamilton. Everyone, stay safe. Stay frosty. Stay aware. I'm signing out.